Okay, hello. Our next presenter is Florian Wilhelm. He is data scientist at Innovex, and the title of his presentation is Handling GPS Data with Python. Thank you, Florian. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk, Handling, Handling GPS Data with Python. My name is Florian Wilhelm, and I'm a data scientist at Innovex. Innovex is a technology consulting company based in Germany in all the major cities. So um, I once had a project where um, the task was to, to relate the, the, the brake pad wear of trucks to the route they're driving and how much they're driving and where they're driving. So this was the time when I first had to like, deal with GPS data because what we had from this, those trucks were GPS data and of course the, the, the current condition of the, of the brake pads. And so this is how I came to that. And when I tried to find information about um, libraries, about uh, what kind of libraries I could use to, to, in order to fulfill this task, I found it quite hard, actually, because normally you're, you're um, used to that whatever Python libraries you're searching, you get a lot of good tutorials and so on, but it was kind of hard for um, GPS, and so this is the reason for this talk that I want to share a little bit about the information, uh, about things I found out during this uh, task. And of course, I'm also, as a mathematician, interested in the algorithm and uh, the, yeah, the mathematical algorithms in that domain. On, and it's always good to, to have a talk, right, when you're going to a cool conference like the EuroPython. So first of all, when you're starting to, to deal with GPS data, the, it needs to be stored in a way, right? So um, the typical format for GPS is the so-called GPX, the GPS exchange format. And um, it's based on XML. It describes three different points. So we have here three different uh, things. We have waypoints. We have a route. So route is um, yeah, the, the way you actually want to go if you're, for instance, using it for hiking. And then the actual track, that's um, the route you then actually took because maybe there was uh, some kind of mountain in between. And um, this is basically what this uh, format is describing. So to give you a, a little bit of an idea how the general structure looks like, we have here um, the, the waypoints, as shown before. We have um, the route, and the route is just a, lit, a list of different route points. And we have the track. The track is composed of several segments. And you're using segments, um, for instance, when, when you lose your GPS um, signal, you start a new segment, or when, when you're hitting pause, for instance, on your, on your running sensor, then you start a new segment. And um, each segment contains many track points, which build up then the track you actually took. And for this um, presentation, I will use not the customer data, of course, but data I took from my, from my watch, from, uh, from Polarflow, it's called. And um, this contains only a track, because if you go for run, you don't, normally don't plan um, the route. You just go for run, and it tracks your points. And we have here the latitude and the longitude and the elevation, and of course, the time when this uh, measurement was taken. So how do we now deal with those kinds of files? So there's uh, one library called gpx.py. It's a gpx file parser for reading, and you can even write uh, gpx files. It's uh, licensed under the Apache 2.0. It contains a nice small uh, command line tool, gpx info, that gives you some basic stats about your files. So if you're just interested in, OK, what was my average uh, um, velocity, then you can just use it. It's Python 3 compatible, what is always important with small libraries like this. It's written by Tomo Krajinda, and uh, it's used on his website, trackprofilerapp.com. So how do you actually use this? Um, so it's really, really easy. You just import it, you open, um, you open the file um, as a file handle, and you just pass it, and basically that's it. So what you get back is an object, and you can then use um, the tracks attribute to, yeah, to um, access the different tracks. In this case, we only have one track. And the segments, 
in this case, I also had only one segment. And um, then normally what we do, right, we, if we want to deal somehow with um, this information, we um, make a data, frame, a data frame, a pandas data frame out of it. And that's exactly what I did here. And I set the index time. And that's the data frame. So, so far, so simple. So, of course, so, uh, since um, GPX is something really visual, we want to plot it. And just to give you an idea, so this was one of uh, a run I did in, in, in Hamburg. So this is if I just plot the longitude and the latitude with the help of matplotlib. Um, exactly. And this was just, so just the track, so just the line. What happens if we plot not only the line, but the actual points with uh, dots? Then we see that we have a lot of points. We have more than 10,000 points, actually. So at that point, I might think, okay, maybe 10,000 points for a small run is, not, uh, is, is way too much. So how can we reduce it? How can we reduce the number of points that we have to deal with less data without actually destroying the ge geometry of the, of the track? Um, so a really simple trick is we use only every 105th point. And in that case, it works because I was running with about always the same uh, speed. But this would not work if um, I had done this with a car. Or we also see that on straight lines like here, of course, you would need less points to describe a straight line, only two points, actually. But in a curve, you would need more information to describe the curve. So you see there's the need to somehow use a cool algorithm to, to simplify a GPS track. And uh, one algorithm that is uh, quite often used is the so-called rama douglas poiker algorithm. And um, I think it's best explained in, yeah, in how it works. So let's assume we have this GPS track, and we want to simplify it. And what does simplify mean? So we have to give some kind of, of epsilon, some kind of error that we say that's OK to make that kind of error but not anymore, not, not more than a, a certain epsilon. So the algorithm just works taking the first point to the last, drawing a straight line, and this, this epsilon um, surroundings, this epsilon environment around that straight line. And the algorithm goes, if now all points would be inside this epsilon environment, then we could just reduce all points in between. If it's not the case, then take the point which is the furthest away from this line, which is that one, and apply the same algorithm recursively on the two um, segments that um, are by splitting at that point. So one segment is that one here, and the other will later be that one. So we start with um, inspecting that one. We see, OK, all points are in this epsilon environment. We can just remove that. And now we do the same here. We have the problem not all points are included. We take the one that is the furthest away. So that one, we're going to split up from here to there, and then from there to there. So first this one, we can remove that point. Here we have the same problem again. And this is how this algorithm recursively works. And we see that we have um, simplified the track, we reduced the number of points. And if we go back and forth, you see this even better. And this is an algorithm we can use and which is quite often actually used um, to simplify a GPS track. And we will later make use of this. So in this case, I just use this, um, this algorithm. And um, yeah, at that point, one should also make an, um, yeah, one word of caution. So never ever use recursion in uh, Python. You will always run into problems um, if you go if the, your recursion is too deep. So if you have more than uh, recursion depth of more than uh, 100, uh, 1,000, then you will get into trouble. So it's better to reformulate this uh, algorithm iteratively, which makes it more complicated. But this is, is what I did here. And um, yeah, so I used an implementation uh, that is iterative. 
and I just run it on the long and latitude, and I can reduce the number of points from more than 12,000 <clears> to less than 200. And we see here the outcome. We see, as expected, straight lines are really straight lines. And here, for instance, during a curve, more dots are actually used. And um, yeah, that's it about the simplification. So when I was doing this project with, uh, with the trucks, I had only longitude and latitude. And of course, I was interested in kind of finding out, OK, uh, what was uh, the height, uh, the uphill and downhill distances the car was actually doing. But OK, where, where do I get the, the elevation from? So I was, I was looking around. In, in my track, so this is the track from, um, from a bicycle ride uh, I did uh, in, uh, in, in Italy. And um, there I have the elevation, but I will now just remove it so that it is like it was in the project that I don't have it. In that case, there's a really good, cool um, extension to GPX-Pi called SRTM-Pi. And SRTM-Pi stands for Shuttle Radar Topography Mission Elevation Data for Python. And that was, um, I think, maybe some of you remember in the year 2000, there was this huge uh, yeah, NASA mission where they were um, using radar to find out the elevation um, almost everywhere on Earth. And this uh, data is publicly available, and this is just uh, yeah, an interface for it. And you can really easily use it to get um, the elevation data. So you just import it. You say SRTM get data, and you say add elevation to the GPX file, to this object we opened before. And what uh, SRTM will do, it will just start downloading partial files with, the, with this data and add it to your GPX file. And additionally, we can say, uh, please smooth the elevation. Um, so two neighboring elevations are uh, averaged in that case. And um, yeah, so if I just plot it to see, to compare the elevation that my, my sensor um, took or measured, um, to compare it to the SRTM data, we see that it's uh, yeah, basically almost the same. So this works always great if you don't have um, the elevation data, but you somehow need it. So of course, if you do a project, in the end, you want to present something to the customer. And the customer always likes nice pictures. So I was also facing the problem of how can I now visualize the data in a, in a nice, uh, customer-friendly way. And I found out about a library called MPL Leaflet. And the nice thing about this is uh, it can just use any mud plot, plot and put it into a panable, zoomable, slippy map. So all these maps you see in web pages where you have OpenStreetMap or Google directly embedded in a, in a web page. It's extremely easy to use, also a new BSD license. It integrates fantastically well with the Jupyter Notebook and Python 3 compatible. And the word of caution, um, you should definitely simplify your tracks with the rama douglas polger algorithm first, because if you started uh, using it with uh, 10,000 points, then it will not work. OK, so how does it work? As I said, it's really simple. We start with a matplotlib plot, that one we have seen before. And now we just project it onto OpenStreetMap. We just import MPL leaflet and say display the figure we created before, and this will, in Jupyter, embed it into the, into the output widget. Or if we would, say, would have said show, then it would just open a new window. And this is fully um, interactive and zoomable, and it's two lines of code to actually embed this somewhere. And uh, this is, so I really, really like this, um, that, it, that it's so easy. And another track um, that I want to talk about a little bit more now is um, yeah, this, uh, this bicycle uh, ride um, I did in Austria and Italy here. And um, when I was looking at the data of the track, I found out that there are some, some curious uh, things. So 
if I call the get uphill downhill uh, method of uh, GBX pi, it tells me that I was actually doing um, height meters of 4446 and uh, yeah, and downhill about the same. I was wondering, okay, I mean, sounds good. That's a lot of height meters to do actually by bike. But the organizer, they, he told me, or it said it it's, uh, on the website that it's roughly uh, 2,700 height meters. So strange, so somehow my sensor must have measured something strange or maybe I'm doing something wrong. So it was, I was trying to start investigating. And if I looked, when I looked closer at the, the elevation, I realized that there are just bumps here. And these bumps are quite unreali unrealistic. So um, we directly see that um, the elevation sensor measures in uh, accuracy or precision of one meter. And sometimes it jumps up and it jumps down and it jumps up and down. And if you do that a lot, of course, if you measure the uphill distance on that side, you gain uphill meters, although this seems quite unrealistic, right? So we have to somehow smooth the data because this is an artifact of the sensor that's not the actual position I was at that time. And also when I was looking at the speed, I was quite, uh, yeah, um, feeling strange that I was sometimes doing 230 uh, kilometers per hour, which is on a... <laughs> On a bicycle, I mean, I mean, it was going downhill sometimes, but even downhill, that's uh, way too much. <laughs> and um, this was also, I mean, I was using the GPX file at missing speeds function, which basically takes the time and the distances and calculates uh, the speed. So it shouldn't be a mathematical problem. It's more like the, the problem got to be somewhere in the data. And we directly see that this peak is extremely unrealistic, but why, how do we know that this is unrealistic? I mean, it's like, okay, we have the picture of a bike in our head, and we say a bike has a position and some kind of velocity, and if we know the velocity, then the position will be, um, the next position will be somehow based on the current position and on the speed vector we, we have. Or if you see someone like walking, if you see me walking, then you know in the next second I'm going to be there because this was my direction I was going. And so we have this kind of model in our head. And this is exactly what the Kalman filter is all about. So Kalman, um, actually, um, he passed away just uh, three weeks ago, so a really beautiful mind. And he came up with this idea of describing giving a model to some to all kind of physical things and in this case we have a, um, we want to describe like my, my bicycle ride and um, the idea is that you have uh, um, that you have states states you can't really directly observe not like the, the real states and I can think of my um, of my bicycle like having or me on my bicycle of having a position and some velocity so this is this state and uh, state x and um, somehow I want to project this into the next state. So if I have, uh, like I said before, the position and the velocity, I can just use the velocity and uh, add it uh, times the time to the position and I will get a rough idea of the next position. And then we have in the, in the general form, of course, he's a mathematician, he made it as general as possible. Uh, we also have a control vector. This, in this case, we would not need. But, um, for instance, if you're looking at a falling apple or falling ball, then this could be the, the acceleration due to gravity, due to gravitation. And, of course, we always have an, an error term. So the error term is when I'm walking and slowly changing my direction, then this is uh, part of the error term. And then, besides the state equation, we also have uh, the measurement, measurement equation. So this is what, where the GPS idea comes into, uh, into play. So the state, I said we cannot directly observe it, but we observe a measurement, and this, the measurement is somehow generated from um, the state plus an additional um, error. And this is uh, basically the, the main idea. And now 
that I kind of have a model how I think something physical, some process behaves, like my ride on a bicycle, and on the other hand, I get measurements, and those will never be exactly the same, I somehow need a method to, to bring them both together. And this is so the, the, the main idea behind um, the Kalman filter. So I take everything I know up to a certain point about the process and about all prior uh, measurements. This is called here um, x hat minus. It's a kind of a priori state estimation. And then in the next step, I get the measurement. This is the set k. And then I want to somehow get an a posteriori state estimation, which is better than my a priori knowledge I had before. And this I do by taking my a priori knowledge plus some residual between um, the, the measurement and um, the state like mapped onto the, the, the measurement I would get directly from my a priori state. And this is multiplied with the k, the so-called Kalman gain, and finding an optimal Kalman gain is um, now the hard part. So optimal in the sense that um, you want to minimize um, the error covariance. And if we had something like this, and actually we have, we can just use this to, to predict and to correct and do this iteratively with each new measurement and then we have the basic idea of the, uh, then we, not the basic idea, that, but then we have the Kalman filter. So what happens is that we use our, our um, yeah, uh, transition equation, our, um, our model about our physical process and make a prediction with the a priori knowledge, also with the error covariance and then the measurement comes in, we can now correct it, we calculate the optimal Kalman gain, so this is the formula, but you just ignore it for now. Then we do this optimal averaging of our a priori knowledge and um, the measurement, and we get an update and can go back and start doing this for the next time step. And for instance, if, you, if you're looking, at some, uh, if you're looking on, on Google Maps and if you're losing this measurement update because you're losing your GPS signal, you see that this, there's always this circle around your point which is starting to increase. And this is exactly what happens in that part, in the prediction part. If you're losing GPS signal for five, uh, six seconds, then it's, uh, this circle starts increasing. And then some more measurements come in and the circle goes down again. And this is directly what you see in many, many uh, GPS applications. So for our Kalman field and our concrete case, um, the model state equation is just the next position is the current position plus the velocity times uh, dt, so velocity times um, the, the time step, plus um, some noise, and the, current velocity, the, the next velocity is the current velocity plus some error term. So that means I'm not um, accelerating or deaccelerating so fast or it's it should be something, a smooth process. And if I write this in vector notation, I just get this matrix. So this is more or less just transcribing this down to, um, to this matrix here. In our case, um, the sampling rate of um, this, uh, of this uh, watch is one second, so dt is just one second. And um, the, the measurement equation is also really, really easy. We are measuring only the GPS uh, position. So with the help of GPS, we only have the position and only implicitly we somehow know something about the velocity. So that means that our state, which includes um, the position and the velocity vector, gets mapped to only a measurement of the position plus some, um, yeah, plus some error. So this is uh, like, a, like a really easy equation. And um, what we also know in this case, we know something about um, the precision error of uh, GPS. I mean, you can look that up. It's something like 10 to 30 meters, um, and this um, relates to 
uh, 10 to the power of minus 4 in uh, longitude and in latitude. And I assumed an error of the elevation of 100 meters. So the, the elevation with GPS, so never trust it. It's really um, extremely uh, in, in, imprecise. And uh, this I take for the error covariance variants. So far, uh, everything about the, the math, and uh, yeah, I hope you get a you get a, a good understanding of the basic idea um, of Kalman. So, as I said before, maybe as a small summary, you have some model, some model equation, some measurement. You somehow optimally average those two to get a better idea of the the current state. And a really cool library for this is uh, PyKalman. It's a Kalman filter, a smoother, and an um, yeah, expectation maximization library. It's uh, that simple to use and uh, really powerful. Comes with um, uh, many examples and a good documentation. Besides um, affine or yeah, linear um, transition matrices, you can also define uh, nonlinear and non-affine um, state um, models. It's licensed under a um, new BSD license, and it's written by Daniel Duckworth. And now we're going to use it um, to actually help with the curiosities we found in the data. But before that, of course, we have to do some, some, some data wrangling. So again, we start up with uh, Panda's data frame of our data. And yeah, we start looking a bit around. And uh, by looking at the tail, I realized, OK, it's not really one second, the sampling rate. Um, it's, it's sometimes uh, less than a second. So the difference is not always exactly one second. And uh, it's really important that uh, the time interval is uniform for this discrete Kalman filter. So what we have to do here um, is that um, I was just rounding the, um, the, um, yeah, to, the next, to the next full second, the, the time. But what about signal loss? So maybe uh, I had signal loss during my bike ride. And um, yeah, how can we check that easily? For instance, we could just use the NumPy function diff and just do this over the time index. And then we see if the difference of two uh, entries is not one, then we know, OK, there's got to be some kind of uh, uh, signal loss. And we have here, we see we have three times we have a signal loss. And we can fix this. We need to fix this. As I said, we need a uniform time interval. Um, we can fix this by just using the pandas resample functionality. And this we do with resample one second. And we get some additional uh, rows, which are, of course, not available. Because um, yeah, that's uh, the data that were in, during the time of the, of the signal loss. But yeah, we need it. This is, we're going to fill these uh, values later, or Kalman filter is going to help us um, fill these values. Now, since the Kalman filter works with um, NumPy arrays, we have to go back now. We have, um, we have our pandas data frame with a longitude, latitude, and elevation. And we take the values, so we uh, convert it to, or we take the, the pandas, uh, the, the, the NumPy array from it. But we don't use a normal uh, NumPy array, we use a masked array, because uh, Pi Kalman expects us that the, the real measurements are, um, yeah, are so no, the missing values, that, that, that they are masked. And this is exactly what I'm doing here. And so the none values are directly masked. And um, additionally, I just plotted. Um, the, the signal loss points to, to get an idea where the signal loss was. Here was a tunnel, for instance, and um, yeah, to, to just double check. So now, basically, we are all set and fine for uh, using the Kalman filter. So um, we have our state transition equation F. So this is just the matrix as we've seen before. DT is one second. Here we have our measurement uh, matrix. So this is three cross uh, six matrix. And um, we have our covariance here, covariance area error. And um, we need to define an initial state mean and initial state covariance. So like an initial condition that uh, I just take the, the first measurement. 
And we give all that to the Kalman filter from the PyKalman package and say what we don't know is actually the transition covariance matrix. So how fast I'm like, for instance, changing my direction on the bike. So this is something we don't really know, but we can ex estimate it. And um, this is what I'm saying here. So my expectation maximization variables, variables should be this transition covariance matrix. And then we can just fit it. And fit it is just call it, uh, calling um, KF EM, so expectation maximization again, on the measuring and a number of iterations. So this uh, I took, took 1,000 iterations just to be sure it really uh, converged. This takes a very long time, um, like a, f a few hours. And uh, now that our model is fit, we can use it to actually smooth um, our measurements, and we get in return um, a mean estimation of the states I really had at that point. So now we're going from the measurement to the real, to the x, to the to the to the states I described before. And um, if I plot now this uh, states, so this is on the on the right side, and to the left are the the measurements. We see that actually it's, it's, it's looking much, much smoother. So we got rid of all those little bumps you saw. And um, it's, it's, it's looking fine. And uh, of course, we can ride it back, the smooth uh, track. And um, this just basically is we iterate over all the segment points. And... Um, yeah, we, we, we fill it back in, and then we call the get uphill, downhill distance again, and we end up uh, with uh, 2,677 uh, height meters, and this is roughly the, about the 2,700 height meters that the organizer told me about, or told us about on the web page. And so, yeah, we are fine. We used um, the Kalman filter without um, actually... Um, yeah, coming up with some cool smoothing tricks. I mean, I talked to other people and said, yeah, why didn't you just like take two or three points and took the average somehow? But then you have a lot of variables you need to fit. And here with the Kalman filter, we actually only described the physical process, the, um, the relation between velocity and the position. And it turned out to be just fine. And uh, of course, um, if we do this with the speed, the speed was a little bit more involved since you, yeah, one had to be careful with the, um, with the points where the signal was lost. So the problem is most, um, most sensors, uh, GPS sensors, already have some kind of Kalman filter inside. That means if you're losing the GPS signal and then, for instance, you go in a tunnel and then you start getting your first measurements at the end of the tunnel, and what this uh, sensor then does, it still thinks you're still in front of the tunnel because this measurement is way off what, it's expect, what it expects it to be. And then it starts like, yeah, going after the real measurements. So it realizes, okay, the, the measurements are really, uh, so I'm really somewhere else. And then you get like jumps where you're really, really fast. And this is what, what happened here. Um, so I had to delete a few points and uh, use the Kalman filter to fill in um, the more realistic points. But in the end, um, it turned out really good. So I was uh, driving, according to this, about uh, 77 kilometers per hour, which is um, still fast, but um, I mean downhill, and uh, was checking on my tachometer, and there it said something about 70. So the maximum speed. So they're still a little bit off. And um, what's cool about the Kalman filter, you could even now use the data, for instance, of, um, of your tachometer from your bike to actually, um, yeah, to, to average the, the, the measurements from different sensors to get an even more precise estimation of your, of your state. But this is uh, beyond this talk, but it's uh, possible. All right, so this is um, about, uh, about the libraries um, I used. 
So I want to give a short summary of all the libraries. We have seen right now um, up to that point uh, GPXPy for reading and writing GPS files, uh, as well as imputing missing values like the, the, the elevation, which you can do with SRTMPy. Uh, we have visualized um, our GPS tracks with um, MPL leaflet, which uh, uses internally the, the leaflet map, which is a JavaScript library. Um, we've talked about the uh, Ramadukdas Polka algorithm. There is um, actually, there's really an, an implementation of it, RDP, which you can just pip install. But as I said, be careful with this. It's, um, it's programmed recursively, and uh, for my tracks, it just didn't work. And um, then there's uh, Pi Kalman, um, the dead sample Kalman filter. I have um, a few more notebooks uh, that I uh, created during, um, yeah, during I made this uh, talk, during the creation of the talk. And you can find it here. It's, uh, it's a total of four notebooks where you can uh, play around with it. And um, I left several parts out, but there you, have the, you can get the full pictures and just play with it. Um, of course, credits where credits is due. So um, the RTP example, so this nice animation I took from Mario's card house, the waypoint track graphic from Wikipedia. The logo on the first slide is from No Maps. So if you haven't used this uh, app, it's really, really cool. So for all the Linux users, um, it's a really nice open street map tool, um, yeah, similar to yeah, the, the, the Google alternatives. The Kalman prediction correction graphic from Pilchin's blog. And uh, if you're interested um, about reading more about Kalman filter, there's a really good uh, Kalman and Bayesian filters book by Roger Lappi, or Lappe. And um, yeah, he's also using um, Jupyter notebooks and uh, showing how Kalman filter and Bayesian filter work. Okay, so um, you can find this talk under that URL. And uh, thanks for your attention. Thanks for listening. And I'm ready for some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Florian. Is there any question? Hi, great talk. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering if uh, standard uh, geo libraries like GDA or OGR don't supply like uh, comparable functionality. What? Sorry, I didn't get the what kind of libraries? Do you know about libraries like GDA or OGR, which are uh, yeah pretty standard uh, geo libraries? Um. I, I haven't uh, I haven't actually checked them out, but um, the um, I, and the question is, do they have a, a cool um, Python interface? So I but they do have a Python interface. I was just wondering if they also supply GPS specific functionality, but you don't know. No, no, I, that I don't know. So I was. I was doing, when I started this uh, research, and for me the, the most important point was that I can really easily access it from, from Python. And um, so um, maybe I missed it, but um, so far uh, I don't think so that um, you can easily use them. All right, but thanks. thanks. I'll try it. Uh, Hi, so thanks. And uh, what would you do if you had to deal with uh, uh, GPS data in feed format? You know, Garmin is exporting just the feed format. Mm -hmm. And there is a Python feed parse library, but it's not uploaded uh, since two years ago. Would you use some GPS Babel to uh, trans uh, transform it to this uh, GPX? Or is it OK? Or I mean, what would be your approach if you have experience? So I would, um, I don't know this uh, format of Garmin, so since, um, yeah, I'm quite liking if you're using the, the, the Polar products, they directly allow you to upload or download everything in GPX, but in this case, I would look for a converter. There surely is a converter, and if it's, uh, yeah, a human-readable format, this Garmin format, is it, or is it binary? Is it completely? Binary, because it's more efficient in memory and in... 
when you like have really long tracks, it's really memory efficient, so it's not human readable. Okay, then um, you might be having a hard time, but maybe there are converters for it, I guess. Um. Uh, fit uh, files can be imported in the Garmin website and then exported there as GPX. It's a cop out, but. Okay, okay we'll see. <laughs> Okay, this, but that's uh, yeah a good point. So if this uh, always problematic, if you use uh, proti uh, proprietary um, formats, then okay. But then it should be possible to find software that uh, transfers it to GPX. I'm quite sure then. So often uh, GPS data also comes with uh, like a value of accuracy. Um, I don't know if that was available in, in, this, uh, in this talk or in this, in this system. Uh, would it be possible to also use that data to make it more accurate if you know the accuracy of the GPS data? Yeah, that should be uh, definitely possible if you have at that point, I mean you have for you have for each point this, this error covariance matrix, and if you have then an estimation even what the error is at that point, you can also use that um, additional uh, information. You could use the error maybe just as new state variable, and then um, use your measurement of the error to, to correct this. So uh, yeah, I would need to think about this, but it should definitely be uh, possible. Yeah. So basically, with the help of the Kalman, um, whatever kind of uh, sensors you have, um, having different error variances, and even if you have a, yeah, a measurement for the, uh, the variance, for the error, then um, you can yeah, merge them together to get a better estimation. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Any other question? Okay, thank you very much.